Good morning and welcome to First Lutheran Church where we gather to worship together as God's people. We come together to pray, to sing, to hear God's word, to confess our sins, and to eat a meal together on occasion. We are glad that you are joining us and hope that your life will be blessed by the time that you spend worshiping with us. If you would like myself, Pastor Naomi, or Pastor Jim to come to your home, to your apartment, to your room, please give the church office a call and we'll be more than happy to come and visit you. Thank you for being with us today and God's blessings. Welcome to worship. It's hard to see you out here this morning in the, amidst all of the quilts, but it certainly makes it more colorful and uh, Peg is going to explain that to us in, in just a moment. Uh, construction update on what's going on. I see everybody found their way into the building this morning. Uh, the demolition will continue probably for the rest of this week. will probably be uh, uh, the end of demolition. And then we have a design committee that's uh, getting to work that will be choosing the interior finishes and a stained glass committee that will be uh, choosing a theme for uh, the windows. We're working with the same company that built these windows. On that regard, if you would like to uh, help us with the design of the windows, either by just giving us some suggestions or even serving on that group, which is going to be led by Tom Dorscheid. Uh, just see me or, or call the office. Uh, that's going to, obviously going to be an important part of what we do, and it's going to add a lot of beauty uh, to, the, to the project. Uh, and also then floor coverings and those things will be covered by uh, that committee. Okay, uh, Peg, you want to tell us what's going on here this morning? Good morning. One of the things that was always um, amazing to me once I stopped working all week long was how much life there was in the church during the week. And on the ministry fair is one of our opportunities to um, allow everyone, whether it's folks who are retired or our young families coming second service, to get a sense about all of the richness of life at church. And it goes on all week long. And many, and most of that occurs, not with staff. It occurs with a multitude of volunteers, the folks who spend their time here just because they want to serve. And some of them are internal, things we do for us and for our worship. Many of them are outreach ministries and ways that we serve the greater community, the, the nation, and even things that we send overseas. Um, many of the quilts you see in front of you will be sent or that you're sitting on or enjoying um, will be sent overseas for warmth um, through Lutheran World Relief. So if you would, we would love to have you spend a little extra time if you're the sort that normally leaves right after the service and you have a few moments. Please join us in between services as we gather and ask folks what do you do and why do you do this and, and how does this work? Um, or just simply enjoy the time together in the fellowship as we, as we get a sense about all of the ways in which we serve God and serve others. So, thanks. Okay. Please stand as we begin our worship with our confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, Come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lift high the cross. We continue on page 147 in the front of your hymnals with our hymn of praise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit would be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We continue with This is the Feast.
Let us pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning is found in the sixth chapter of Amos, and the prophet Amos is warning the Israelites. Alas for those who are at ease in Zion, and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria, the notables of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel resorts. Alas for those who lie on beds of ivory and lounge on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and, like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile, and the revelry of the loungers shall pass away. We continue with Psalm 146, and we'll read that responsively. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps promises forever who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Alleluia. Our second reading is from 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter, beginning with the sixth verse. Listen as the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy. Of course, there is a great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this, Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of my witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, to whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. So ends our readings.
Thank you, Lynn. Our gospel this morning comes from the 16th chapter of St. Luke. Would you please stand as you're able for the proclamation of the gospel? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you're in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. The Bible talks a lot about money, a whole lot about money. In fact, this week, all three of our lessons are about money and wealth, especially the problems that can result from wealth and how it can get in our way. And don't worry, this isn't going to be a stewardship sermon, at least not this morning. Today I thought I would make your coming to church worthwhile by teaching you how to get rich quick. How does that sound? Worth coming this morning. I'm not a financial guru. I said that I had to look, so I had to look somewhere for some really good sound advice. And where else could you turn? I turned to the most reliable source of information available, to the internet. And cleverly, I googled how to get rich quick. Forbes magazine uh, popped up an article first listing 365 ways to get rich. And I figured, that's too many. I didn't have time to read all that. I want to get rich quick. So I, wanted, uh, I found a website that lists only three ways to get rich. I think that's more manageable. And I have them here to offer you this morning, free of charge. Number one, invest in aggressively in the stock market. That sounds pretty reasonable. Number two, spend all of your free time generating wealth when you're, when you're young. Work all the time when you're young so you don't have to work at all when you get old. For some of us, I guess that one's already a little too late. And number three, invest in real estate. Now, how simple is that? Why didn't we think of that? before. Do those things and you'll get rich quick. But you know, there's only one catch. According to everything we read in all of those gospel, all those Bible readings today, all three are completely and totally wrong. They are wrong, says scripture, and teaches Jesus because they miss the point of what it really means to get rich in the first place. Jesus says they miss the point of what real life and real riches are. If I can summarize Jesus' teachings on wealth, it would be 
Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven and don't let earthly treasures get in the way. That's how you get rich. Well, what are the consequences if we let worldly wealth get in the way? Our first lesson, I mean in our gospel lesson, it's pretty clear. The consequences are burning in hell for eternity. I don't want to end up looking like this guy. I don't want to end up burning in hell. But when I was growing up, these were the kind of pictures we saw were shown in confirmation to warn us to be good because you could end up this way. And I think they were used in stewardship programs. Give or, you know, you could end up like this poor guy, the rich man in the story about Lazarus. That could be you. Now Amos talks about those lazy people who lay around on fancy ivory beds and fancy clothes. And for, I guess for those of us, it would be those of us who sleep till noon and spend the rest of the day on the couch watching football and playing video games. They won't have it so good either. They are going to be the first ones who are thrown into chains and are carted off into slavery. You know, these aren't such good things, and the last one isn't either. In the book of Timothy, the young Christians were taught that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And it's not money itself that's evil, but it's the love, what love of money can do to the human heart. And the consequence here is being pierced, it says, with all kinds of sorrows and hardships. This is a pretty negative laundry list of, that hungering after worldly riches can lead to. The bottom line of all of this, if, if I really want to help you find a way to get rich quick, there's got to be, be a better way than investing in the stock market or real estate or working yourself to death when you're young. And when I was pondering this, the beautiful country, Himalayan country of Bhutan came to mind. Bhutan was in the international news pretty prominently a few years back for an innovative way that the government has decided to measure the wealth of their nation. In the United States and most developed nations, there is a measure called the Gross National Product, or GNP. It's a strictly monetary measure of how much wealth is generated by a country every year. In Bhutan, they use a measure called gross national happiness. They measure all the areas of life that lead to satisfaction and happiness, and they keep track of it year after year. I think Jesus might have been taken with that idea. It reflects the kind of wealth he urges us to seek. So here are some ideas, some ways that I have come up with, mostly I have stolen, uh, to see how we can get rich in the way Jesus talks about. And I think if we can integrate these ideas into our way of thinking and the way that we approach the world, then we are on the road to a truly rich life. And by the way, they are all based on solid theological and biblical principles. I didn't get these off of the internet. Greet each day with enthusiasm and hope. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And on the sixth day, he looked down on all of it, everything he made, and he said, this is very good. Each of us has the opportunity to experience God's good creation every day when we get up. As soon as we open our eyes in the morning or even before, we can erase the hurts of the previous day and start with a clean slate. God's creation always remains beautiful, even when life turns ugly. But when you are sad, turn away from yourself and turn toward God. The original sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden was selfishness. They put themselves, their own desires, their own security, before God. And when we turn our focus on the hurts in our hearts, we get trapped in an endless cycle of sorrow and self-pity. 
God will turn joy, sorrow into joy and self-pity into gratefulness if we turn to him. Challenge and even suffering can bring you closer to God or destroy you. You choose. Life is full of hardship, suffering, and challenge. Most accomplishments of value challenge our will and our ability. When you bring God into your life, challenge is turned into opportunity. You are powerful. You can choose if you will let suffering define you or refine you. Suffering leads to endurance, endurance leads to character, and character leads to hope, says Paul. Feed your spirit or you will reap unhappiness. You are a spirit person. If you do not feed your spirit, you will not be happy. All happiness comes from within you, not outside you. Pray, worship, listen to beautiful music, rest in the sun, sit quietly and let God be with you on God's terms. God wants you to be happy. Turn from self-orientation to meekness. You know, there's little room in our modern world, I think, uh, for the meek. The successful, we are taught, go out into the world in the morning and take no prisoners. It's a jungle out there. Kill or be killed. It takes a real effort of self-will to intentionally put ourselves below others. But Jesus says it in so many different ways. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Appreciate the suffering of Christ in Gethsemane. It's easy to get down on life, on others, and even on God when things go badly. But think about the last time when you saw someone else who was enduring what seems like unendurable hardship or suffering. And you look at your own daily problems and you say to yourself, or maybe even to someone else, you know, this really puts things into perspective for me. My troubles are nothing compared with theirs. And suddenly your own problems seem much less significant and solutions appear. Think of how Jesus suffered that night in Gethsemane, knowing that hateful crowds were jeering at him, Roman soldiers would soon be torturing him, that soon he would die, and even his closest followers would desert him. And soon your hurts and your challenges will be put into perspective, and you'll find new solutions. Avoid fear as though it were your greatest enemy, because it is. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 32nd President of the United States, said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now remember, this came from a man paralyzed from the waist down with polio, had the challenge of leading America out of the Great Depression, who declared war after Pearl Harbor leading America into its greatest war in history, resulting in over a million U.S. casualties, the greatest number in any war. But Roosevelt was exceeded in this advice by Jesus, who repeated it again and again and again. Have no fear. And he could say this because he knew that through our faith, our spiritual life is assured. Martin Luther put it this way, in a mighty fortress is our God. Were they to take our house, goods, honor, child, or spouse, though life be wrenched away, they cannot win the day. The kingdom's ours forever. When you cannot love someone, 
look deeply enough into their eyes to see their hidden pain. In your everyday life, you will encounter people who no matter how hard you try will seem unlovable. These are the people from whom you have the most to learn about life and about yourself. As painful and distasteful and unfair as it may seem, look deeply into that person's eyes to find their hidden pain, for it is there. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Bring to your mind the image of Christ on the cross, wailing, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do when he was being tortured. In the process, you will become a vic- not become a victim, but a victor. Avoid pessimism and criticizing thoughts. All of us are wired differently. We all get up in the morning and see the world in different ways. I see the news reports of what's happening in Charlotte and think, you know, those rioters are criminals. And you think, isn't it, a great, isn't it great that we live in a country where people can protest openly? Some people see the glass half full. Some see it as half empty. But in reality, the glass really is half full and half empty at the same time. It takes years to rewire our brains to think differently. But we can recognize right now how we look at the world and learn to value other people's perspectives. Instead of being pessimistic, we can be practical. Instead of being naive, we can be creative. And finally, give yourself over to the Holy Spirit of God. This spirit is not an idea. It's not a biblical symbol. The Holy Spirit is not really a dove or a flame or a wind. The Spirit is the love of God itself, breathed into you and leading you to truth. The Spirit can be a still, small voice that speaks in quiet moments of your prayer. Or the Spirit can be a raging fire in your belly driving you to immediate action and passion. We all know that I can't teach you, and I don't know how to become rich quick, but I don't have to. You who have come here, you who have come to Christ, are already heirs to the kingdom of God and the unfathomable riches stored for you there. All we have to do is step up and claim those riches. Amen.
Please rise as you are able as we use the Apostles' Creed found in the bulletin to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing in the Spirit's work among us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God, we thank you for the church, its mission, and its ministry. Help us to be examples of the faith and to pursue righteousness in all we say and do. Bless the many who work in special ministries in our church. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the well-being of all creation. Make us wise stewards of your rich and beautiful world. Lord, in your mercy. Ruler of the nations, we pray for peace in places of conflict and war, especially in riot-torn Charlotte. We pray for exiles, refugees, and those far from home. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who are lonely or homebound, those who are trapped in any kind of prison of body, mind, or spirit, and for those who are sick or injured. Today, especially, we pray for Jeanette, Don, Marion, Marcia, Karen, Maddie, and Kay. Lord, in your mercy. God who sits high but looks low, we pray for our brothers and sisters who struggle to make ends meet. Provide for all of our physical and spiritual needs. Lord, in your mercy. We remember and give thanks for all your saints in light and for those who have recently died. Thank you for the good foundation of their lives and witness. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for everyone to drink. 
saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Everyone is welcome at the Lord's table. Please come. You may be seated.
Please stand as you're able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those you have fed with this one heavenly food through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord uh, bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. A reminder that Pastor Jim has his class at 9.30 between services. Please join us at the ministry fair and go in peace to love and serve the Lord.